My name is John Moore. Um, I've been on the scene for a couple years now. This is my first time at DerbyCon. Um, I kind of try to take the approach of we have a lot of problems in security. You guys know that. A lot of you guys know we can make a good living. Try to fix those problems. Try to come up with solutions. Some things seem to come back over and over, recurrent themes. So last year I was kind of looking in um, uh, more of what I call it more of a war walking, uh, stroll trolling. Uh, with the robot, and I was more looking at what we can do when we extend the tools in an Android uh, environment or a tool set, right? Pen testers, this could be helpful for you. Uh, this year, I realized that we still have this horrible, horrible problem with passwords. So what I decided to do was just kind of take it on as a project. I call it the Password Intelligence Project. But effectively, I'm going to kind of run through from uh, the beginning of what passwords are, how they came about, what they do for us, um, how they get exploited, how we can go about fixing some of the problems passwords cause for us today. So as you see, this is a high thread track. I, I like to give you guys kind of a break fix. I don't want to scare you without some type of resolution. So I give you guys some viable options to our alternatives to uh, password technology as we know it. So what I want to do is start off by talking about the, the current problems in the landscape, uh, move into what single factor authentication is versus multi-factor, right? This is something that's really starting to come on the scene and uh, discuss the tools, techniques, and practices that the bad guys or the pen testers use once they get in your network um, based on these credentials. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, recovery resistance methodology. So if I show you guys, I take a tools approach. If I show you how the tools work, and I'm going to actually use an old tool, uh, can enables. Have you heard of it? Okay, but there's new, new tools. I like that cat or uh, Hashcat now. You guys heard of that one? Okay, it does really, really good with multiprocessors, but this, the exact same methodology is whether you use John the Ripper, you can name it, there's probably 20 others out there you can name, but they all still work, okay? And the question is why? So we're going to kind of look at how the tools try to take over and recover passwords, and then we can look to how to stop that recovery from those tools. And so that's kind of the perspective this talk comes from. Um, and then we're going to kind of, uh, kind of um, speculate about what the future of technology is in terms of passwords and authentication. Um, and, but, you know, we're going to talk about solving these problems. We'll talk about uh, how to keep your, hash, your hashes safe, um, multi-factor authentication, some options. So we're going to go through the whole thing. All right, so, again, this is one thing I realized is people go, password, we're not password problems. Well, if you look, we see some of the big players out there have been smacked by this, okay? And some of the reason they only found out is because when they started cracking passwords, like LinkedIn, some of the words came up like link, work. This was their passwords, four, four characters. That's a good password, right? So they started to realize, oh, well, maybe this is LinkedIn, or maybe this is eHarmonies. Now, these actually both got released together. So we've seen that in 2012, um, they believed to be leaked, leaked by a Russian hacker, um, and 165,000 passwords. Now, they believe that this hash had millions, well they know that this hash, had, this hash had multiple, multiple millions of passwords in there. So I think it was like over 8 million passwords between LinkedIn and eHarmony. In the first week, 165,000 of those were cracked already. Okay? Now realize, these came, these were encrypted. They got cracked. So the question is, why were some getting cracked and not the others? So we'll go out to discuss that. Yahoo, the same thing. They had one leaked by a group called Deeds. Um, 100,000, and these were clear text. So those are just flat out. If you get to use the internet password, you walk up to Yahoo, you sign in, got their credentials. All right, that's even more horrific. They didn't even have it encrypted and hashed. Okay, um, Twitter. I, I was doing a, a podcast on February 1st, talking about this talk, the the makings of this talk, and we were talking about how multi-factor can help us. And sure enough, on February 1st. Twitter got hit too, okay? So we're starting to see, even the big companies are getting hit by this, all right? Now, again, I said, I like to bring up the things that are problems. You guys heard of the data breach investigation report put out by Verizon? This was their findings. 76% 70 of the network intrusion exploited weak or stolen credentials. All right, that's saying that the bad guys are getting in, not by the other 24%, but because we're having problems with passwords, right? So we need to fix this. This is a huge gaping hole in our security, um, as we can see through things like the data breach investigation report. All right, so let's kind of walk back and talk about how it all started, right? Someone down the line, someone said, we need multiple people to sign in. We need some management. Let's put passwords on it. And they go, okay, well, how do we manage passwords? Well, we're going to have to store them locally. 
Because, well, this was when they first came out, there was not an always-on mentality like Microsoft is starting to develop, okay? Um, so if you were not connected, your password wouldn't work. So you had to still stick, keep it local. Well, some smart admin, maybe people in this room, said, you know what? With the right credentials, I can go in there and just access everybody's password. All right, so let's fix that. Let's hash these passwords, and then when you put in your password, we'll compare it to a hash if it matches your end, if you're not, okay? So this is kind of how it all built up from scratch, right? So this is how we started. Now, this is kind of an example of how these passwords get hashed, and you can use any hashing mechanism. I'm just referring to SHA-1. This is one that I pulled for B-Sides. I could have done it for DerbyCon. Um, and this is a, a SHA-1 or an MD5 hash for those, okay? So that would be my password, and for that to match, I have to type it in the keyboard, it has to use the exact same ha hashing algorithm, make, the, make whatever its value is from there, compare it to the hash that's in the database, if it matches, we're good. If it doesn't, we fail, right? So this is the process right here. We type in our password, in here we can do DerbyCon, whatever our password is. Again, not a good password, we'll talk about that. Um, and if it matches, we give access. If it doesn't, it just prompts you again. So for you programmers out there, it's a very simple loop. Okay, so now let's talk about the constitution, the, the, what passwords are, are created by, right? So Again, they're there to act like a deterrent to let us in or not. But really, when we think about it, most passwords these days are alphanumeric. So what do they consist of? Let's break it down to its parts. There's 26 lowercase, 26 uppercase, 10 numbers, and then usually around 33 special characters. If you're doing web banking or any type of like web portal, you may be limited because some of those characters um, can interfere with the web app itself, right? So they kind of limit you. So that's not great because there's actually banks out there that only they'll limit you to 10 passwords and they'll say upper, lower, and, and, and numbers. Now that's already limiting us because our character set right here, we're saying it's 95. And again, this is a basic mathematical permutation problem, okay? So anytime we weaken it or we take some of those out, we say we're weakening the complexity. Is everybody familiar with that, right? That sounds familiar? Okay, good. All right, so Passwords effectively work like this. Let me show you the breakdown. It's pretty straightforward. So your entropy or all your possible combinations or permutations come from the strength of the password. So your total comes from your complexity raised to the length. Okay, so if your password is all alphanumeric, your complexity would be 10 characters, 0 to 9. You guys following right now, right? If you did, for instance, a phone number, 7 characters, it would be 10 to the 7. Like here's a phone number. These are all the possible characteristics. Now, they actually ends in a zero and not a one because you wouldn't count no password. So you don't actually go down to 10 to the zero because it would assume no password, okay? So that's the math. Now you can see as we start moving up the chain, we, we get larger numbers. Look at this, really quick. Even though when I use the same number just by going up in complexity or adding it to the higher level, I come up to a huge amount of possible passwords, okay? So if you ever want to look at your password, this is a good way to do it. Okay, also another trick I use instead of calculating this whole thing out, I'll just add one to here. I'll do L plus one. And I'll add that because I always know that my possible permutations will be under that. That's considered a ceiling equation. You guys follow me on that? Okay. All right, so now we know how they work. We know where they come from. How do we recover them? How do the bad guys recover them? How do pen testers recover them? Okay? Now there's a lot of tools out there, um, like, like I said, I'm going to use just because I like the GUI, it gives me a chance to show you guys what I'm talking about, I'm going to use Canonable. You can use Hashcat, you can use John the Ripper, John the Ripper is integrated in things like Armitage, you guys heard that, built in, does wonderful things for you, okay? But it doesn't really demo what I'm looking for, but there's others out there, TAC Hydra, we see a lot from APT attacks or from... Um, some type of remote dump, they do PW dump, where this is going in and just grabbing the credentials and running off, okay? And I want you to think about if they grab credentials from a domain controller, how many usernames and passwords can be kept there? All of them, thousands, right? A lot, right? Okay, so just keep that in mind moving forward. All right, so let's fire up the tool, and I want to show you some things, how it works. All right, here's the tool fired up, pretty straightforward. And what I've done is I've just gone in and I've grabbed the local hash from the SAM, and I've thrown it out. 
Now, it will not store the credentials in clear text, it does it, and, and our hashes, here's our LM hash and our NT hash. Now, if you do any type of Windows hardening, we're gonna, we want to turn LM hashing off. Have you guys heard about this? Okay, we'll show you why in a second. All right, so a couple things that I learned right out of the gates. All right, so I got all their names, but it, it knows that some of the passwords are under eight characters. This is really peculiar. Does anybody know why it's doing that and how it's doing that? It actually comes down because LM hashing is enabled. Anybody know? It's split in two. Excellent. So it is actually, what it is, it's an, it's an older protocol or an older standard. And it effectively said if your password is over seven characters, give them another chunk of memory to store their other seven characters. So your password could be up to 14 character long, but it doesn't store it as based on our equation earlier where it'd be Say it was a number, it wouldn't be 10 to the 14, it'd be 10 to the 7 plus 10 to the 7. For any of you math people out there, you know those aren't the same numbers. Okay? So I can get a lot of cracking power if I come across a machine that has LM hashing enabled. And we'll go through that in a second, okay? But that's still very cool because just by seeing how big the memory size for it is, I can tell whether it's under 7 characters or over 7 characters. But when it cracks it, it's going to crack it in groups of 7. So your password is never stronger than seven characters when LM hashing's on, okay? So if you have a 14 character password, which you can store, it's gonna be two groups of seven, it'll break it down like that. I'll show you guys that. All right, LMNT is the, uh, the successor, and it actually does allow large stores, uh, about 15 characters less, right? So you can have no problem with that. Um, and that is truly the complexity as you think about it. If you had a number base set, it would be 10, to the 14th, if you had 14 character password, then it was numbers, okay? So that gives us a lot more complexity, stuff we wanna to look towards. All right, so I just explained to you guys kinda of how this works. All right, now, there's already a couple passwords hacked here, let's go through them. All right, so if I wanna recover this, if I, my CEO forgets his um, password, and he goes, I need to recover it, all right? Now, actually, I'm gonna give some tricks external to this because I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna look into his psychological profile of passwords, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tailor it to it, and I'll show you how I can do that in a second. But right here, I'm gonna go by through, and I'll say I dumped this hash, I dumped a, a, an AD hash, and it has 115 passwords, which is what I used as the data set for this. I created 115 random, pulled them in um, through script, and just ran through them. So the first thing I'm gonna do when I start doing um, brute force, and this is the concept where I'm just going from A to Z, A, A to Z, 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 and moving down the lines, okay? Um, I'm gonna start off with numbers, because I can crack to larger links quicker when I have such a small amount of characters, okay? So it's a it's small amount of permutation. Now, does that mean I'm gonna catch, catch every password? I want you guys to think of phishing. If you go phishing, it doesn't guarantee means you're going to catch something. It's not called catching, it's called phishing. But if you go there enough, you can find out the spots where you're more likely to catch fish. You guys follow me? Okay, so I might start off with 10. I may not catch all of them, but out of a thousand passwords, maybe I pull one, okay? Now what a red team member will do is they'll log in through that, or an APT, they'll log in with that, they'll escalate privileges against that account, and then they'll pivot in your network, okay? So they didn't need an admin account, they just need one account to get in. And based on what I'm gonna show you guys, statistically, it's very easy to achieve. Okay, so say you say, all right, well, instead of going through from the highest to the lowest, and you guys can see it's gonna be hardest to crack the 95 character set, it's gonna take a long time, gonna need powerful computers. Uh, we can just say, all right, fine, let's, let's just use a dictionary. In fact, this is quicker. This is what I would do before I even went into the brute force, okay? So well, this is actually the dictionary that's included with it. Now, you can see it's not a normal dictionary. There are special characters in the beginning. They have Oracle spelled with zeros because sometimes Oracle admin like these. In fact, this is set up to know certain passwords that people use. And if you go online, you can find tons of dictionaries out there per industry. So if you're looking for healthcare and you're looking to do some pen testing at your healthcare environment, you could pull a dictionary that's all words for healthcare, okay? Now, this is really interesting because I want to show you what it does. When it goes through the dictionary, first it goes through as is. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. But it will also reverse the password. So if any of you guys have a password, why don't you think of your passwords and see if they would meet the criteria of not getting caught under this system. If I reverse the password, that counts. So you see password becomes drafts app, all right? Uh, double password, you think you're really slick and you're gonna put your password in twice to give it that extra length? It's gonna get it. If, you're, if your password's cafe, 12, and you go cafe 12, cafe 12, 
this will catch that. Okay, because it's built into it to try it. Uh, lowercase to uppercase, it will try as lower, upper. It will go through permutations. It will try actually going upper, lowercase permutations. So if you think you're slick for putting the fifth letter as cap, and it's in a dictionary, it's catching it. Okay, it'll even catch elite speak, where it will actually substitute numbers for the letters. So if you think your P at dollar sign, dollar sign, W, zero, R, D is safe, it's not, okay? So th this is what we do. We also see, and this is a good one, and people do this, think a bunch of password. How many people put a number at the end of the password? So, you know, Fluffy my dog, Fluffy. I'll make Fluffy 01, that's secure, right? Okay, that's gonna get popped by this. All right, so you, you can see that it's effectively going through that. So what I want to do is make sure you understand when you're making your own passwords, don't add anything that would catch this. Don't do it twice. Don't reverse it. Um, I'm going to actually give you guys a, um, an in-clay protected def defense and depth strategy of how to create passwords based upon, um, upon this. It'll make it a little easier for you. But again, you see how the tools crack it, beat the tools, and you beat your system getting recovered. Remember, passwords are not reversible. They have to be guessed and then matched, and if you match, you win. If you don't match, you move to the next one. And if we can hide it in the, as a needle in a haystack of needles, it becomes much harder versus a little flag and a beeper on it, okay? Shouldn't be easy. All right, so I throw the dictionary tack on, again, 110. I find, I find four right out of the gates, all right? And I look at some of these. Some of these are hard. Luminescent is not a small word, but it's in the what? Dictionary. It's in the dictionary, so we get spanked. It's gone. Okay, so now I have four ways to get into this network, not just one. So if I screw up something with escalation privileges on the first guy, don't worry, I got three more tries. Okay, so again, now you gotta think statistically, you may have a good password, but for your entire company, does everybody in the company have a good password? Would they make it through this? And the answer is more than likely no. So we see why we 76% say we have a problem. Now, even Moxie Marlin spikes in on this. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but he's a big name in the industry. And he's created a tool called Cloudcracker, which is effectively just a giant um, array of uh, fast and powerful machines. And it can actually go through a dictionary with a very, very so what we got? Uh, millions, billions, trillions. It goes through 80, 385 trillion words, okay? In about 20 minutes. Costs you about 17 bucks. And that's how much it might cost you to get into their network, okay? Now, actually, I, I got yelled at for this first time. I, I gave a talk very similar to this because they said, Amazon, we as pen testers use Amazon. We can crack your password for 50 cents or less. They brag about it, okay? Using these same techniques. All right, so I started to ask. Now, the, the thing that makes password cracking difficult these days comes down to the fact that we don't have the power to go through all the possibilities, right? There's a movie where they have this remote control and you hit the fast forward button and things fast forward. Now if we actually did that for our, our brute force attempts where we're trying everyone, if we had a fast enough computer, we go through every possibility until we find it. So the key for a good password is make it difficult. All right, so if any of you guys or know anybody that uses pure numbers, so this is running, just so you guys know, I used a low-end machine um, that had a virtual machine running, so it's already splitting CPU power, and on average I was cracking about, or running about 8 million passwords a second, okay? So I am really throwing some power at this, and I don't have power to throw at it. Now if you take Hashcat, throw it through 10 um, graphics cards, you're gonna get performance way better than that, okay? And so you're gonna be able to crack more. But I'm looking at this machine, I'm saying the average individual, putting their stuff in, is there anything here that they're gonna get cracked or not cracked? So if you're using just numbers as your password, up to 11 digits, takes four hours or less with this machine. I'm gonna get your password, or the bad guys, or the pin, or the red team's gonna get your password very quickly. So you can see here, it took only two minutes for this you know, ancient program to break a, um, this eight, that's a nine character password, 10 character to 22, and because this is factors of 10, just keep acting, adding a factor of 10 to understand numbers. It gets a little tougher as we move up to the other ones here. So here's lowercase. Notice it only starts to become intractable at what one, at what number? What number of characters does the password start becoming more difficult to break? It starts becoming like swimming through jello. What is it? So 10, and, and, and in two years, I probably won't be able to say that anymore. It'll probably be 11, probably be 12, okay? So I argue, as much as you may not want to, 
I, I suggest a 12 character password or higher with full complexity, okay? Uh, just to make sure that even if someone's running a, a, some type of cloud cracker or some type of, um, say, state-funded machine that could have millions and millions of um, processors on it to, to make it difficult. But for us, about 10 characters is it. So minimal, if you can handle 10 characters, you're going to give them a fight. I right, launched you to add some complexity. So for all of them, we see that. That really, right about at nine characters, it finally goes into the green for us. So think 10 character passwords or higher. Please do not adhere to eight. Well, this is a very old and, and, and almost arbitrary story behind how eight characters took place. Um, so, you know, again, time moves on. What else do we have to crack it? Now, we also have this tool called Rainbow Tables. Have you guys heard of Rainbow Tables? And so one of the tricks that encryption experts do is they go, we're going to slow you down. you got those 8 million password time attempts per second. What if you have to churn through the algorithm to get there 10,000 times? It's going to make it really slow on you. So some smart people out there decided, you know what we can do is we can pre-calculate all those values. We'll go through that million times. We'll pre-calculate the hash. And effectively, we'll have a, ha a, a dictionary of already calculated hash values. And now we're going to really just do a dictionary attack against you based on hash values. If we find it, we have some major book out there that says this hash equals this password. You guys follow me on that? But there are problems with, with rainbow tables. The problem has come down to space. So if you look right here, I have an NTLM, which is the stronger type of, of password encryption, using lower alpha sp and spaces from 0 to 9 characters, 12 gigs, pretty big file. Okay? But as soon as we go to one to eight characters, which is a smaller amount, but it does mixed alphanumeric, we're at 104 gigs. Okay? Now you gotta think about it, if I move to nine, that's gonna go up by a factor of, you know, assuming it's alpha mixed numeric, so that's at least 62 more. So take that number, 104 gigs times 62. You start talking terabits, okay? So there's this trade-off between how big of a of a rainbow table you can handle on your machine based upon how much you can crack, okay? So we see it's literally a time-space trade-off that comes from this, from this tool or technique. All right, so then I used to, we got through dictionary, we understand the concept of brute force, we got through some of these um, super crackers. So how do we weaken the passwords? How do we make it so that if you are using that 13, 14 character passwords, how do we weaken your password so possibly you can recover it, all right? So I'll show you a trick. Now, I, you know, this is one of my early dives into password recovery. I go, okay, that would be slick. I know the password policy at this company has to be eight characters or more. So I'm going to pull out any searches from one to seven. Sound pretty good? It's pretty straightforward. When I do that, I actually removed three trillion possibilities. That's a big number. I don't have to go through them now. Okay, because I know it can't be those because it won't be one to seven based on my, the company policy that I'm doing the pen test for. All right? But if you look, I've only degraded it by what? 2%. That's nothing. Right now, it might as well almost be the same. Okay? So what else can we do? We've got to have some other strategy. All right, now this is where we're getting some of the new work uh, on this problem. All right, so August Dvorak, back in 1936, discovered that when we type, we don't type with the same frequency on our keys. Pretty straightforward. The other thing we have a tendency to do is when we make passwords, we need to make them memorable. So they fall into English rules or whatever language you use, okay? So common characters will become in a statistical structure where we have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 passwords. We can leverage our knowledge of statistics of keystrokes to make it so we have a higher probability of getting their password. So if you look right here, our highest, this is from highest to lowest. What do we hit the most on the keyboard? All right, now I want you guys to think Wheel of Fortune. Okay? What do they do if you guys go for the final prize? They actually start you with letters. Why are they starting you with letters? Because for their game, what? It's their most, the ones that everybody asks for. Okay? So I already showed you guys the strength comes from having this huge set of characters. And I also said if you go fishing and you know the lake, you may know the area to, to, to fish to know get the most fish. So what if I just took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten characters and ran them through? What do you think? Do you think I, I mean, if I have a thousand passwords, do you think based on the rules that I may get some? Okay. Now, I actually did it off of a random key set. I had 114. I only pulled one password doing that. But guess what? 
I pulled one more than I did before that, okay? And all I need is one to get in, all right? So, oops, sorry. So here I'm doing, and I'm just removing, I, I, that was a very extreme key set space um, shrinking technique. This one I'm just gonna take off the far end, the one that, that rarely get used. So if we look back here, you can see there's ones hiding like Z and J that don't get used that much, okay? So I'll pull those off. All right, and what you can see right here is that here I'm going to an eight key space, here I'm going to a nine key space. Look at the time between them. They're almost identical because I've weakened the possibilities. Now here's the catch. If you're, any of those passwords I'm trying to hit have these letters in it, I'm not getting them. But I don't need all of them. I just need a couple, okay? Actually, I just need one. All right, and so that's the key is when we have statistics on our side, we're almost guaranteed to get it. All right, now look how this works, and this hopefully will change your mind a little bit on how you make your own passwords. So think of Mississippi. It's a pretty big word, all right? But if you really look at Mississippi, it only constitutes how many letters in it? Four. So if I go into my character space in my program for cracking, and I can take out everything except for its constitution of four characters. It will then crack it for me. So all I have to do, sorry guys, is type in MS, M -I -S -P and go, go on all the passwords. The one count that had Mississippi for its password gets hacked in one second. Okay, now if I would have left it in there, what we assume are presumed Key space says that's going to take 13 years. Okay? So, but now, with just taking out to grabbing just the character's amount, bringing down that key space, we have now turned into one second. Okay? So, a lot of us still are in the thinking of presumed key space. Oh, Mississippi, that's a good word. Okay? And again, I'm only going off 26 characters. If we assume upper and lower case, it gets even bigger. All right? So, effectively, what I want you guys to start doing when you start thinking about your passwords, start thinking about the complexity or the uniqueness that lives inside your password. So, quick example, Utah and Ohio, under our old school thought, would say, these are equal. They're not equal. Because Utah has four unique characters, which the math would be four to the four, versus Ohio, which would be three to the four. You guys seeing this? Okay. All right. <laughs> So effectively, when you set up your passwords, make sure you guys are setting up passwords that have, that don't follow all the rules we talked about before, doubling, numbers at the end, and also try to make sure you don't use words that have a lot of repeat characters in them. They're going to make it easier to get caught with tools like this. Okay, so there's been a lot of options, or a lot of situations that have occurred historically. Um, I believe his name is... Aaron Barr, can, he, he could speak to this, um, that the fact that sometimes if you use the same password elsewhere, bad things can happen to you, okay? So you get a lot of problems, people say, look, I have a, I mean, passwords are our digital kingdom. They're the keys to get in, right? So we have a ton of passwords, and people will go, i got to remember so many passwords, I'm just going to use the same password for everything. Not the best idea, because effectively, you've given someone the master key to the schoolhouse, right? So the janitorial key that gets in all the rooms. That's what you're doing when you're setting that up. But you go, hey, look, it's too hard to remember. So what I want to do is kind of give you guys some thoughts about how you can create unique IPs for every device, unique passwords for every device, but have something to do with the site. So I kind of, I call it a, a virtual um, second factor, okay? So, um, if, for example, if you have a Gmail account, now these are very, these are very obvious um, examples, but that's what they're supposed to be. So, GMA versus my Yahoo account, all right? And I, this one I decided to be tricky, is I took, what I do is from every website that I have a password for, I don't do it, but you could. Um, you put the first three letters, yeah, I don't like to be as my passwords. Uh, first three letters of the site I'm on. So if this is, say, Hotmail, it might be hot, it might be something, I might pick a key to the right of each letter of hot, right? But I use the same algorithm for every site, okay? Now, some other things we should do is some special characters, because what we saw earlier is that if I throw out the special characters, 
I might get some of those passwords. So by doing the special characters, now we're making it that the fish are in a different part of that pond, and they're not going to catch it. The other thing I do, so originally, so let's say this was Grandma's password. It was Fluffy. And she made it strong by making it Fluffy1. And we had to tell Grandma, no, that's not a strong password. And then we tried to explain, well, this is your Gmail account. So let's set it up where you build in some information here. So if this one gets compromised, this one may not. And again, you can see that through here. So we're getting complexity. We're getting length. Okay, and you're getting a way to remember your passwords. All right, so it's almost an off the grid type strategy. All right. Okay, now well, if you say, "Look, John, man, I I can't remember a password. Even if I do the same rule for everyone, I can't do it." All right. Well, the good news is there's tools out there that can help you. All right. So if you are password remembering a challenge, um, you can choose one of these. Now, a lot of these have costs associated with them. What these are effectively just a, a, a vault service where effectively they keep your passwords for you. They have their own issues because someone can compromise their, their um, site and their databases and then your stuff becomes um, available. But there are some that actually will hash things on your machine. The trade-off there is that if your machine dies and you forget your password or the hash, you're not getting anything back, okay? The bad side on the other side is, is that if something gets um, exploited from their side, they may not tell you and your information can be out there. So if you guys want to keep it cheap, key pass. Works for pretty much every operating system you have. RoboForm, uh, it's a little more expensive. Uh, if you've got the money to blow and to uh, burn, about 30 bucks. LastPass, pretty decent, about a buck. Okay? Splash ID, 19 bucks to nine bucks, depending on which one you're using. And one password, if you are one of those, if you are a Mac fanboy and all you use is Mac, you have some options as well. All right. so. Again, I wanted to show that this, is, this was 2012's list of worst passwords. So you guys think you have a bad password? No, you don't. Those are them right there. And effectively, what these were were the most cracked passwords. All right. Now, I want to know what's in the psychological makeup of people that they decide monkey is their best password. I don't know, but monkey is in there. All right, dragon, sunshine, and if you really love someone, you write I love you as your password. Right? This is all bad stuff. Okay. And again, notice it follows these people's passwords are following all the rules we talked about earlier, being in, a, you know, in the, the same structure of language, which means that all the statistics we talked about about um, keystroke um, probability would play out here. Okay, so what can we do to fix this? We have some issues, right? So one of the things we can do is from a, I, I like to take the, the, I love security awareness, but I would rather be able to give security on the enterprise side and not on the user side. I don't want to rely on the user. Can it help that the user knows to make strong passwords? Absolutely. But what if we can make them use strong passwords? Does that matter? I think so. It's up to you. I mean, it's, hold it yourself. But Bcrypt is a tool out there. So if any of you guys are developers out there and you want to keep your password safe, you can actually download this. This is a, a program that has a Java, Python, C, Ruby, Perl, the list goes on of implementations. And what it will do is it takes that those, those encrypted hashes in your SAM, and it will salt and uh, encrypt them. So it will be double encrypted. So if someone does steal that password file, they're going to have to first hack it to get it to show the true um, values of the hashes. So effectively, a two-step process, which makes it much dif more difficult because, as I said earlier, I want to beat the tools. As soon as it comes down to bcrypt, all these machines go, or all these tools from Hashcat on down go, I don't know what this is, I'm broke. So first, we, that, that's already making it tougher because now you have to have someone that has the skill set to be able to try to run back through this. And what they did is they used Blowfish, and you guys know Blowfish, it does a lot of iterations, it's very slow, okay? Again, we could probably use something like, a, like a rainbow table on it, but again, it takes lots of time and it would be two steps. So that adds a lot, and the, the implementation's already there. All you have to do is add it to your system with whatever programming language is your favorite. So something to think about. These are interesting. This was a new concept that came up with from a guy from RSA. I think it was was a Rivist. I actually don't want to lock into who did it, but um, effectively this is cool. What they did is they came up with the concept of what if you put fake accounts and then you look to see if they've been accessed. Oh, that's kind of cool. So Mickey Mouse is in your system. He's never logged on before, but he logged in last Thursday. Your passwords are compromised. So like a honeypot, but with passwords. Okay? So cool concept. The problem I don't like with it 
is that if it's a legitimate account, even if you give it no privileges, what I said earlier is your pen testers are going to escalate through hacks anyways. So you've given them, even though it's a fake account, if it has real access, even though it might just be a guest account in terms of what's behind on privileges, if they can escalate, it's still dangerous. Okay, so something to think about if you guys want to use it. The other thing is, is that you have to monitor it. You don't know your honey passwords are, are, are breached unless you keep checking. So there's going to be that aspect to it as well. Cool concept. All right, so for us to kind of push past where we are today with security, we're going to have to understand there's multiple types of authentication out there. So you guys are used to what you know. That's the one that you're locked into, what you know, right? So I say log into your, log to your Gmail account, unless you guys have two-step on which we'll talk about in a second. You're just going to put in your password and go, Yahoo, same thing, right? So there's actually three different types of authentication. If any of you guys are, you know, this is probably old hat for many of you, but some of you might be new. Um, what you have is one, what you know is the other, and the last is what you are. And everything we have falls into those three. Okay, they're, they're actually thrown around possibly a fourth one based on reputation. It hasn't picked up yet, but I just want to let you know about it. All right, so wristband, ID card, security tokens, software tokens, phone, cell phone. These were all what you have, what you know, what you have. Excuse me. So, for instance, if you are using um, a RSA token, anybody have one of those? Okay, yeah. So that is adding two factor. How does it add two factor? You got to have the token, right? And then you got to have a pattern that, or your your password to go with it, making it a two factor. Now. So let me give you guys one and tell me what it is. Um, how about a, uh, how about your, your blood vessel signature? What would that be? What you are. What you are, right? Good. Um, and again, there's some horrible scenarios that go on with things like what you are. So for instance, I believe there's a car, I think in Taiwan, that got stolen. And how it got stolen is they put the guy in the back alley and they cut off his thumb and they started his car with his thumb, okay? So they only get two tries to do that, but two more than I want. All right. Um, so some problems with that. Again, other ones, you know, what if you did a retinal scan or you put your eye into it and everybody in the company does it, tomorrow everybody has one pink eye. Things to think about. All right. What you know, what you have. Okay, so let's kind of bring them together, make sure we understand them. Now, if you go into Google and you, does anybody have a soft token where they actually go into Google and it says, I've never seen you on this computer. I need you to give me a value that's going to pop up in your cell phone. You guys seen this? And they call it two-step, but it's actually two-factor. Okay, why is it two-factor? Because it's something you have and something you want. So it makes it two-factor. Now, if you said, I've seen this before, I've seen engineers go, we're going to make it really strong. I'm going to put a password at the BIOS and a password when you log in. Okay, now you've still just locked yourself into one factor. So you've created a two-step authentication, but you haven't given the strength of two-factor. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you do password twice, or if you did your thumbprint twice, that would be two-step, okay, versus two-factor. So it's good to understand. And again, I show you guys here, if you did something you know twice versus something you know or something you have, okay? Now, what we see is that all our password problems, like 99% of them, go away when we move into two-factor. So why don't we move into two-factor? Well, there's some issues with it, okay? There's usually a cost associated with it, right? Now, not necessarily, but there can be. Okay, so let's talk about each one and what we got. Now these are, you may have these, uh, these are just your smart cards, pretty straightforward, okay? The RSA token and YubiKey. These are all examples of hard tokens. Now these are actually the best. These, if you have this, good for you. You're probably much more secure than anybody just has a password. But the problem with these are they are a physical appliance. You have 10,000 employees and you have to get an RSA token for everybody? You're going to pay dearly for that, okay? So there's a huge cost. Now let's say you wanted to give two-factor uh, ability, but you don't want to. You want to save some money. Well, this is a big one now. Is there? I don't want to call anybody out, but most people in this room probably have a smartphone now. Okay. Now, may, especially in this room, but in the overall general population, most people still can even get text. All right. So a lot of these tools will actually just text you a number. It gives you a soft phone ability to it. Now, the problem with this is too. What if someone compromises your phone? Can that happen? Yeah, so now they can actually, and, I, and there are rats out there that can send back all your messages without them being seen. So think about the machines infected. They already have your password, but you're two-factor through your Gmail, but they've infected your phone, and now they're sending back both pieces, right? So the hard token saves you from that. You're going to pay more for it. But again, this adds a lot of work for the bad guys. They don't want it. They're lazy. They want to do as least they can to get what they need. Uh, I won't say it about pen testers, but... Okay, uh, so...
so, and then last, uh, last, yeah, right, so we have hard and soft, we're good there. And then, so moving to some of the, um, the two-factor authentication that's already been implemented. So if any of you use web design app, app uh, web services, they use a multi-factor. Um, Dropbox has a two-factor. Facebook has one. Twitter and Google, Twitter, once they just got hacked, they go, it's a good idea, we'll do two-factor now. Okay? And we see why, because it works. A lot of our problems go away when we start doing multi-factor. Hotmail and Microsoft um, moved into a security code, and PayPal have a security key as well. So we see a lot of companies do that, and why? It works. Okay, now this is kind of cool. So if you're into application development, you go, my company wants two-factor, and I'd like to develop that so people can sign into our portal and have that ability. Google puts out an open source project called Google Authenticator. Has anybody heard of that? Good, good, most of you guys. All right, so effectively it uses two algorithms. Um, both under common RCs, and it has availability, it has versions for PC, Android, iOS, Blackberry, and PAM. So for your Unix and Linux, right? So this pretty much installs anything. So there's really no excuse for your company or for your web portal not to create some type of two-factor. It's there and available. Okay, now this is kind of cool. I uh, was looking at some, some new possible technologies for the future of uh, two-factor. And this is something they're doing, I believe it was in Taiwan, they actually have their smart card, they have smart card based chips that actually have a code so they act like RSA tokens. So when you do all your purchases, you actually have to put in that token number instead of the three little digits on the back. And it always rotates, right? So if they get it, you get your numbers today, they gotta actually have the card, which makes it much more tougher, much tougher for someone in China to, you know, or I'm just using China, I'm not picking on them, um, to use that card and, uh, you know, so they wouldn't be able to use it if they didn't have the card. And this one I thought was really cool. And so this was a um, authenticator that used your brain waves. Yeah, that's right. So um, you could use a two-factor here, right? So something you have, your own brain waves, right? So if you're you're using the force, you're moving something across the room, that could be your login, okay? Um, and and it uses EEG or brain waves with this little little cool little trick here to uh, make sense of it. So, you know, moving into the future, we, we may see, who knows what we're going to see for, for multi-factor, but if this is just used as single factor, we don't get that strength, okay? So, what, what, what we need to look here is that passwords are a dying breed, but we unfortunately have a ton of zombies walking around, right? It's not there, they're not giving us the strength they used to, however, you do use them, I want you guys to think 12 or 14 characters, beat the tools that, that will uncover them. Okay? If you can't remember your passwords and you want to use all these tricks, that's fine. Write them all down, put them in a safe. Okay, at least you got them in one physical location. All right? uh, but effectively, if we do all these things, we see that all the problems that were going on with the network intrusions go away. Two-factor solves most of this. Okay? So kind of a, a, a call to action to think about anytime you can, move to two-factor. If you can't, make sure you guys have passwords that are unique for each of your sites. And you know, make sure you have your the complexity, the length. If you guys are admin, uh, make sure that you guys are doing things like um, can you guys enforce password policy through through any system? Absolutely, right? There's, you can do it through through uh, through PAM or th or through um, uh, access control information, right? So that's good stuff. All right. So there's all the links. Um, if you guys can reach me, if you guys have any questions external today, I'm going to go into questions here in a second. Uh, you guys can reach me at rabbitsecurity at gmail. I'm also on Twitter at, at rabbitsecurity. Um, with that, I want to open up the floor to questions. Anybody got any questions, concerns, complaints, hold the complaints? Yes, sir. Um, just, just a note on biometrics. I've done a lot of work there. Um, when, when you use biometrics for authentication against uh, Information security systems. Yes. It actually doesn't add any security because most applications don't know what a biometric is, so they just encrypt the password in the local cache. Sure. So if you are so actually two, two step versus two factor effectively. Yeah, I mean if you're attacking the actual application and and the passwords, it's still dependent on the password. Yeah. So it yeah. adds no security, and there's a lot of confusion because in physical access, the readers on the doors actually do match the fingerprint template. Yeah. It's not the case in, in with information. Yeah, you guys systems. heard they just hacked the new iPhone stuff already. You guys heard that the Chaos Computing Club already right. spanked that process. Yeah. So yeah. So and again, you know, so if you guys get two factor. I would definitely like RSA, the hard tokens, the soft tokens. 
uh, I, I would argue is a much better example. However, just by even doing two steps, we get some type of addition to it, especially because unless they are grabbing it remotely, there has to be something locally, biometrically, that is causing that data to go in, right? Uh, right. right. Put a thumb in there? No? Okay. <laughs> Question? Just a footnote on that. Uh, usually your thumbprint or whatever your biometric thing is is hash. And if that actually right. cracked, you can't change your thumbprint. That's true. That's true. And yeah, they only got nine, nine more tries. The uh, the other thing is with the smart cards, you have to sheet them in this mylar sheet. Yeah, yeah. In fact, they just saw another one where they were sitting people on a couch and they were reading their cards. You know, just sitting on the couch. I don't know if you saw that one. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you.